Back to Practice has been made possible with support from Allergan, an AbbVie company, Johnson & Johnson Vision, and IOR Partners for Office-Based Surgery. We'd like to thank our sponsors for their support of this programming. I want to welcome you all to uh, a session that I've really been looking forward to, and that is, you know, training the next generation of ophthalmologists and, and how this time has, uh, you know, affected things as we've tried to pivot, you know, for our practices, our, our patients, and, 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 and folks that are in training. And uh, thank you, BMC, for putting it on. Yeah, yeah I'm really excited about the uh, group of people that I'm with, uh, Dr. Uday Devgen, Dr. Uh, Priyanka Sood, and Dr. Ralph Chu. And, and uh, I'm going to have them introduce themselves in a second, but just a little bit about me. I practice ophthalmology in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, with an emphasis on refractive and cataract surgery. Uh, I have some uh, amazing partners and and we have uh, centers in North Dakota, in Montana, Nebraska, and Minnesota. And we are heavily involved in training, uh, you know, medical students uh, and residents that come through. And then we have an accredited anterior segment uh, fellowship. And uh, I think we'll have some things to, to offer this evening in this discussion. Um, while we're doing the introductions, I will say to the group out there, it would be great to um, have some questions come in that you may have for all of us that are, you know, involved in training in our, our own special way that you'll learn about. And we have some fun stuff that we're going to be talking about, but any um, discussions that you'd like uh, our opinion on, feel free to use the chat box to, um, or use Facebook Live to send in a, a message to us on how we could uh, best uh, answer your questions. And, and so Priyanka, maybe I'll start with you. If you could just say a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Vance. I'm so excited to be here with you all tonight. Um, I think we've got a great topic and a lot of wonderful people to discuss. Uh, I'm Priyanka Sood. I am at the Emory Eye Center in Atlanta. I'm an assistant professor, a cornea cataract refractive person, and uh, chief of service at one of our uh, smaller hospitals, Emory Midtown Hospital. So I've had a really interesting vantage point during um, all of this. And yeah, I mean, I just have to say that while we all have been forced to pivot and to think outside the box in so many ways, I think it's been a really great opportunity for growth as well. And so I'm excited to um, discuss tonight with everyone. Thank you, Priyanka and, and Uday. Well, I'm in Los you. Angeles. Yeah, I'm in Los Angeles. I, I do a combo of both private practice as well as academics. So my private practice is cataract and refractive, mostly cataract. And I'm on the west side of LA with a big surgery center in Beverly Hills. And then uh, academic side, I'm full professor at UCLA at the Jules Stein Institute, and then also chief of ophthalmology at Olive View UCLA Med Center, which is a county hospital, like a charity type hospital. And in fact, I'm still here right now in these luxurious accommodations. And I teach residents on uh, uh, multiple times a week for the last 20 years. So probably about, uh, about a thousand resident cases per year. And, and thank you, Dave, Ralph. Yeah, thanks Vance. Um, it's exciting to be here with um, all these friends who uh, we've known over the years. Um, I'm a refractive and cataract cornea specialist in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, I've been in practice for over 21 years. Um, we have sort of an academic private practice. Uh, we've done over 90 FDA clinical trials from eczema lasers, uh, therapeutics, lens implants, and presbyopia. Um, we also have a foundation of education. We have, actually have an optometric residency as well as a anterior segment fellowship. We're a little bit newer into the fellowship. We've had our fellowship for about three years now. And uh, I think it's gonna be exciting to kind of share what we're seeing from the interviewees that we're getting this year and also some of the ideas that will come from this panel. Yeah. Well, thank you. I have a lot of respect for all three of you and have been looking forward to this talk. I just finished a big day in the operating room myself. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, that I think that we all felt uh, was a, a, a mixed blessing was we had to shut down for a while. And um, I think we found out some things, you know, about ourselves, you know, probably some neat time with family and some, you know, introspection and, and uh, maybe uh, even just going up 
another notch of appreciating the amazing profession that we have. Um, but you guys have any thoughts about just from your personal perspective? Uh, maybe I'll start with you, Uday. You know, just how you know did you did you guys actually shut down for a while? So in our private practice, we shut down for probably about six weeks and then slowly opened up. And as of now, we're basically at full steam ahead. In our county hospital, with our residents, our teaching hospital, we limited surgery, but because we do the full spectrum, we still did emergency glaucoma valves, ruptured globes, some vitrectomies, retinal detachments. These, we did cases that couldn't wait, but we stopped doing elective cases for about six weeks. But now that all that's been lifted, we're actually going beyond pedal to the metal. So we're now trying to do at least 10 resident cataracts per day because we don't know what the future is. So we want to make hay when the sun shines. We don't know if December, January, we're going to have another shutdown. Right. But during that time, I would love to hear if you learned anything about yourself that uh, you know surprised you. Because there's not many times where your life goes to, you know, for six weeks of, of less activity. Anything yeah. that you... I'm, I'm worried that I'll never be able to retire because I so missed operating during those six, six or eight weeks. Right. It was just, so I worry like now in the future, can I ever retire really? Yeah. And Priyanka, you know, uh, I, you know, I remember what it was like being a resident. I was honored to get in. I was working hard, but Sometimes it seems like over the years, there's an appreciation that settles in that maybe wasn't there in residency. And uh, what was it like for you during that time? Uh, you know, just maybe a brief description of how your reduced time went and what maybe you learned about yourself during that time. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, think I really learned that I similarly don't like to sit and not do anything for very long periods of time. Now we still had to go in to cover the hospital. And so we weren't totally shut down, but I was probably not having to go in, you know, I was going in two out of five days a week instead of the five days a week. And during that time, I mean, so the interesting fact about me is that I have two siblings and both of them are also ophthalmologists. So my sister's a glaucoma specialist at the Cleveland Clinic, and my brother's a retina and uveitis specialist. He just joined uh, private practice in Cincinnati. And so chatting with them every day, because obviously we were really spending a lot of time trying to figure out teleophthalmology, trying to figure out like, what are ways that we can pivot? Like, what are you guys doing there? What are we doing here? And, you know, just that kind of excitement around this opportunity of, well, yeah, I could just shut down. And we did. I mean, I certainly had to take it down a notch, but the idea that like our patients didn't have access to our care and we had this opportunity to maybe turn that around and give them access to care. I think it was fun to, to bring out that excitement. I think sometimes we get into the grind and we get into our routines. And if ever there was a, a screeching halt, <laughs> COVID, COVID was it because it was for everyone. It was the ultimate, like everyone screeched to a standstill at the same time. And so there was no one else to kind of say, you can take over for me because we all have to figure this out together. Right, right, right. It was a, a, such a unique time. Ralph, anything, uh, you know, you learned about you and what was your time like during that shutdown or slowdown? Yeah, we, you know, just um, in Minnesota, we had a mandated government shutdown for about two months. So all surgery centers and hospitals actually had to close except for emergency care. So in our private practice, which is basically an elective premium boutique practice, we had to, um, I've had to do one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, which is actually furlough uh, almost my entire staff for that time. So what we discovered was more about, you know, I think the more the power of connection, you know, the more the power of our culture um, and our why was solid. And so one thing that we really did, and I heard a lot about, you know, we're all, you know, wanting to do things. I think we all did stuff like webinars and reached out and communicated with each other, with our patients, with our staff. But one thing that we did as a staff was actually, we started meditating once a week. And uh, we actually continue that now because I actually think mindfulness and actually being paying attention to the anxiety that's brought up from all the change outside uh, in, the, in, uh, in society, as well as with our patients inside the practice, 
um, there's a lot of change that's occurring. Like even right now with, you know, uh, staff members who have uh, kids and school stresses and how to juggle all the sort of different pressures, uh, mindfulness has really helped us stay close. And that's also helped center me. So I think one of the things that, uh, um, you know, we've done to stay connected with ourselves and with each other is mindfulness and meditation. I love that. Thanks. I, yeah. I, I think that one of our responsibilities in training others is uh, that it's more than just ophthalmology. You know, it's you're, you're on life's journey and, and, and to, you know, as far as being a, a person who cares about their, you know, fellow person, you learn a lot when you're going through a stressful time like this about e each other. And, and I found that it was an amazing time to uh, have the trainees get to see us in action at a time when we didn't know what was really going to, you know, happen. And we had a tendency to just dial it back and have our messages be clear and simple to our team and had our trainees right there side by side with us telling them this is what we know and this is what we don't know and we do know we're going to do the right thing for this work family and our patients and we'll give you an update again at this time and so for the trainees to be able to see some kind of some crisis management by caring and preparing because even though we were shut down elective and still did the pathology stuff i found that if you you know it was a busy time you know to to administratively navigate you know for instance your furlough decision I'm, i i know how big your heart is ralph and that was a lot of communication going on with your team and and how you you know led them through a tough time and and i think it's great for trainees to see more than medicine and surgery but the business and relational aspect of what we do i think that's one of the biggest assets of doing some after residency training if somebody's looking at a any type of fellowship in whatever especially i know we're mostly anterior segment here but uh that's a that's a really um you can't learn that in a textbook and if you know uh you 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 hang with these people who've you know struggled for you know uh many many years in 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 private practice you learn a lot about the human side of caring for people uh the human side of having to manage a team or grow a team um and that really is a huge uh inward journey it's almost like you said work family it's almost like you're being a parent uh in a way um in, in a professional way uh, inside inside the practice. So I think that's one of the most gratifying things that I've done over the last 20 years. But that's one of the things that uh, is invaluable, I think, when you're making that transition from, say, academic residency training into a into a practice, whether it's academic or private practice. You guys bring up great points. I tell my residents that one of the stupidest things I've ever said, and I've said many, was when I was a senior resident, I said, I can't wait till I'm in practice. It'll be so much easier. <laughs> so now in retrospect we almost the exact opposite it's so much harder but there's a lot to learn when you hit the ground in your first few years of practice right right and uh you know Priyanka you practice in uh, a big institution like Uday and uh so you you know we're dealing with uh even though a lot of places were shut down elective, you had a ton of pathology work uh, to do. Did you see a reduction in that too? And did, did you see any residents or fellows feeling like they were just kind of not getting the volumes that they feel like they want to get? You know how you are at that stage. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, so we have a VA hospital as well as a county hospital, Grady Memorial Hospital. And so that's where the majority of the residents get their um, surgeries done. And even those hospitals were shut down for elective surgeries. Um, and so during that time, there was a lot of anxiety for the residents. But, you know, I think, and this is one of the things that I, I try to highlight to my residents is 
just the importance of, of staying flexible, right? Like we always say hard work so important, but I actually think after this pandemic, for my residents, I'm gonna say being flexible, staying curious, mm -hmm. those are like two of the most important things that you can do because what they did then was to start to focus with one another and create groups where they could learn from one another. If you did the case, well, let's go over that case with you since I didn't get to do that case. Or like our medical students, you know, we started doing the lectures with them and they were, like such a big role in us implementing teleophthalmology because they were helping us with, you know, some of our um, colleagues who are not used to have some of the technologies, the Zoom, all these, like this was so new to us, um, but being able to stay flexible and do all those things. So yes, you know, shutting down, it was really hard for them, but they came up with other ideas. And then by the time May, June rolled around, we had, to make up for, for lost time. And so, you know, I mean, just this Monday, I did 14 cases with the resident at Grady. So we just have to like pick up the pace again. So thankfully they were able to make that up. Um, and so I think that they learned a lot through the process. And, you know, again, if we have to shut down again, I think we're more prepared now than we were even then, which is really nice. Right. I think that's a key point, Priyanka, that, um... You know, one of the things we look for when we're talking, well, one of the biggest questions we get um, from the fellowship candidates is, you know, how's your practice doing? You know, and uh, what I hear from that is, am I going to get the cases I need? Um, you know, I think the answer is, in general, ophthalmology has bounced back really well. Most of the national data that I've seen is, you know, practices come back of close to 90% of volume, if not more, on average. But um, the it's not about the technical volume we're looking for somebody who's adaptable who has emotional intelligence who actually can um, function well without structure or function well in a, in a situation where what structure existed pre <laughs> is now changing and adapting and so that's hard for a lot of people some people like to know that on monday wednesday friday i see clinic and tuesday thursday i do surgery um, but you know, in the real world, what if you don't have your nurses available on Thursday anymore because they have childcare issues and you've got to rearrange your clinic schedule and your surgery schedule? And how does that affect them emotionally and their ability to adapt? And you know, the volume will be there, your skills will be there. That's what I've learned. I mean, if you know, um, there's many ways of developing skills, but you know, focusing on uh, uh, yourself and learning how to change and adapt and be stable is and resilient, I think is, is uh, much more important in the next several years going forward. Uday, anything to, to add uh, as far as, you know, anxiety amongst your residents and fellows feeling like they just weren't getting the volumes. And before I finish an, a, a asking you the question, anybody out there who has questions, feel free to, to, to jump in. We, 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 appreciate the the interaction going on on the chat and uh but uday you know any any what was your experience like as far as you know anxiety and people worrying about being busy enough to feel comfortable when they're done training that's a great point but you know i always emphasize with him that while you think when you're a resident 200 cataracts versus 300 cataracts is such a big deal it's only after you've been a practice you realize that Anything less than a thousand is not even halfway there. And so don't worry whether it's you, you've lost a hundred cataracts here or there because in the big scope of things, that's not the issue. The, you want to get as much as you can out of every case. I'd rather you do 200 cases and take home a good pearl or really watch a surgical video of that case and advance your skills based on every case than to do 300 and not get a benefit out of every case. So it's kind of how much you squeeze out of every case. And then keeping in mind that the big picture, now I can tell you, it's probably more like 10,000 cases before you're the master. Right. That's just a year of work for your EU day. <laughs> <laughs> it is amazing though, how much, you know, how you all say, you know, being flexible and, and having a positive attitude and how much it helps during a time when, you know, it's, almost felt like we were in a war together, yeah, but having arms locked and being adaptable, being so, so critically uh, important. And a lot of trainees being so young, I, I'm I was absolutely amazed the maturity levels that were shown during that time. Um, and some of the deeper discussions that happened to be because of that anxiety. And, uh, 
But I think another area of anxiety is the people that are looking, uh, you know, to get into fellowships uh, and, uh, you know, to do training, you know, like you, you all did beautiful training and beautiful background. And when you interviewed, you did it in person and it all transitioned to, you know, web-based and, and what was, you know, what, how's that experience been for, for, for you guys? You know, we're adapting to it. You can't always predict the future. You just got to be able to adapt to it. So even my daughter, who's applying to med school right now, is doing all her interviews for med school on Zoom. That's right. kind of the way it's going to be. And you know what? Uh, it may be there for a while. And so we've right. adapted to it. We're doing our residency selection interviews. Again, they'll all be online. But we'll do our best. Right. I think, again, it's, it's, it highlights how everyone's in the same boat, right? And so it's whether you're applying in ophthalmology, whether you're applying in OB-GYN, whether you're applying for med school, whether you're applying for undergrad, this is just a whole new world we're all living in. And I think it's really interesting and also humbling and also just nice to recognize that everybody's going through it. So you're not the only one. Sometimes it feels like you're only, you're the only one. Right. <laughs> and I mean, as an attending, I'm going through it, trying to learn how to do these like tele-ophthalmology calls, um, you know, trying to figure out how I can maximize seeing my patients who really need to be seen while maximizing social distancing and keeping everybody feeling safe. I mean, mm -hmm. these are all things that everybody's dealing with. And because we're all dealing with it, I think we're coming up with really great ideas because we have these communities. And I think that's the one thing that like we still have to continue to try to build on and grow on. Um, you know, not being able to go to meetings, not being able to um, speak to one another. But right now, I kind of feel like I'm, you know, you guys are all in my kitchen right now. You're in my, <laughs> you're in my home. This is a whole new thing, right? <laughs> How many people have ever gotten to see my kitchen until now? So <laughs> we're, we're navigating all new things and, and yeah. it's pretty fun and interesting. But I think that that's one of the things that we'll, we'll just have to try to figure out how we continue to build communities in spite of not being able to physically together. I think, I think there's two sides to it. I think that, you know, the, the challenge of us getting to know the residents. And so we're trying to, you know, um, maybe even do a second round of interviews where they can kind of do like a fly through the practice, you know, sort of like a virtual visit and, you know, maybe, cause I think it's as important for them, for us to get to know them as it is for them to get to know us. Cause a fellowship is sort of like a lifelong relationship. Um, and I think that really, if it can be like that, um, like m many of us, uh, probably all of us here have, I mean, I think that sort of uh, uh, really adds to your career. So, you know, trying to get that fit is super hard. And I think um, they, they, they're they doing it, I'm pretty impressed with them. They're doing it better than like, say I am. I mean, I'm getting to be, you know, uh, you know, that, you know, they're much more familiar with social media. Um, so I think, you know, having that social media presence, you know, um, getting sort of a constellation feel for who this person is, not just sort of a snapshot through Zoom has helped us, excuse me, has helped us. Um, that's, that's your fellowship applicant right there. Oh my God, I'm getting an interview right now. But, um, <laughs> so, that's a go, that's God, a go get like, a resident uh, right there. There's our top choice. <laughs> but, you know, like uh, figuring out how to get that, you know, sense of connection like Priyanka was saying but you know we're trying to figure out and be creative and I know there's other resources like BMC and other people are trying to create small groups and connect and and uh, talk real time about um, with mentors and with mentees and create these lifelong relationships I think that's something that we're trying to capture we haven't quite figured it out but we're all trying oh there's a great question there Vance look at that one it's come through if I can, I want to just quickly tackle that. It says, in the age of Zoom interviews, how can intangibles of a practice be gleaned? Well, that's a tough one. Yeah. My, well, my problem, I, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say what Priyanka said, that we're all in the same boat, um, you know, is, uh, you know, that's, that's so true. And I, I think for, for me, um, one of the, the things that I've enjoyed about the um, video interviews, like right now, imagine that we're talking one-on-one -on -one and it's just me and one of you. 
and I have your face on my screen, the same size as, it, as us being in person. And for me, that's something that I find helpful, you know, versus little or a whole bunch of people, but that one on one, and I'm, I'm seeing uh, the interviewee's face about the same size I would in person. I find that's a good start for me. Um, and of course, to have a good connection. And it's been amazing to me how seamless the conversations can be. I, it's, it's been a surprise to me. And I think that a lot of these virtual things have gone better than we would have predicted had we not been forced to do it. But I think the intangibles happen through people. And the people part can be conveyed in an interview. I, I, I think it's beautiful to get to see uh, us in action surgically and see the clinic. I don't necessarily see them as intangibles. We can talk with you about that. But the, the people part of it, those intangibles, I actually do think if you just take the time in a virtual discussion, a lot of those intangibles, and you can see their facial reaction and you can hear their voice inflections and, and how much they care. You can maybe even see their humor come out, especially again, if it's not hurried. So I, I do think that um, it's more up to the program uh, to you know, be able to you know, impress the interviewer by having those intangibles happen. And I appreciate you asking the question, Jeremy, because I think that, you know, again, like Ralph said, we've learned a lot in all this. And I, I see myself actually taking that question and trying to purposefully get across our intangibles uh, that they might have viewed that I now need to describe. What do you guys think? Absolutely. I think the interview, you can get a lot. And then my kind of feeling in the back of my head, I always think, do I want to go on a, a trip or a vacation with this person? Like if my family and their family together. Like if I'm interviewing with you, Vance, I'm like, you know what? Can I see myself going fly fishing with Vance? Yeah, that'd be fun. And so then that means I want to be able to connect with that person, not just in the practice as a boss to a mentor or to a mentee, but also in a friendly way. Like Ralph said, this is a relationship you're going to keep for hopefully the rest of your career. And so you really want to get to know someone on a personal level and it's probably more important that to have a great fit there than it is to, to eke out a few more cases. So if you went fly fishing with me. And I've only had, been once before, so I'm not that good. We'd have deep talks and we would uh, cover a lot of topics. And, and how would you deal with the aftermath of not being together? <laughs> of course, this is all tough stuff. <laughs> it's tough stuff. We got to deal with it. Yeah. Priyanka and, and Ralph, you know, Jeremy's question about the intangibles. Um, there are some things we miss out by not being in person. And I think it's a, a very, very astute question. And yes, we're all in it together, but how do we communicate those intangibles? Yeah. You know, I think, especially from the residency side. So the fellowship side is, is unique. And it's, you know, it's very tight between the mentor and the mentee. Residency, you know, for us, for our residency interviews, we usually have a social night where the applicants get to hang out with all the residents. Because when it comes to residency, you actually spend more time with the residents than you do with some of the attendings, right? Because of our Grady, our county hospital and our VA, those are really like resident run clinics. And so I think that if we're talking about when the medical students are applying for residency, like don't forget that you also want to fit with the culture of the residents of the program. And so, you know, there are some programs that are a little bit more cerebral, some that are a little bit more clinical and trying to understand like maybe, and you don't have to know definitively that you're going to do research down the road or, you know, that you're, you want to be an academician, but it can play a role in how you decide those things. And so trying to understand that from the residents as well, I think is really important as much as it is from the attendings. Great, great. Yeah, I, I'm going to be devil's advocate a little bit. Um, just like with telemedicine, I think we've all hoped that it's going to add more to our practices than I think it has for ophthalmology. I think that we all use virtual consults and televisits now. I think in ophthalmology, because of the equipment at the current stage, 
we have to see our patients and we have to feel our patients. And so I'm not trying to be negative. I think Zoom is, you know, very important. I agree with Vance and we can get a lot from Zoom. I've also been pretty mindful of people who are not necessarily as extroverted that have a lot to contribute. So it's an interesting time that if you maybe are more quiet or introverted and you're not really into posting everything about yourself on social media or don't really come across that well through, in, through a camera, that you still probably have a lot to offer. Um, and that's really the challenge that I try to keep in my mind that um, how do you get to those people? And, you know, I, I haven't figured out a way other than feeling, um, you know, the electromagnetic connection of being in front of a person, how to make a true full judgment. And so I, I don't know if there's an answer to get the intangibles through a Zoom or a screen. I think it has to be right now in person. And um, you can get a lot through Zoom, but not everything. And so that's my counterpoint, I think, that I, I can't come up with a real answer to, to answer Jeremy's question. I, I don't know if you can get all the intangibles. I, I think you're you're dead on right, Ralph. I mean, there's nothing. Well, I mean, the most powerful thing we do as a physician is make someone feel like they matter. And the most powerful thing they, they do for us is to make us feel like we matter, you know? And two humans doing that, it, it is more powerful in person. But, you know, I do find that the virtual interaction is sure better than nothing. And uh, I, I am curious to see post COVID, you know, and it kind of relates to the next question that, that Sherry uh, asks, what are we doing now that is gonna continue after COVID? And, and I, I think that I predict that not everybody goes to 100% uh, in-person interviews again. Um, you know, it, 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 I think it worked better than a lot of people would have thought. I think patient, I mean, uh, uh, people may, you know, have more of a choice and we may see uh, that be something that is a carryover. Um, some of the stuff going on in our program that, that I, you know, um, think is here to stay, Sherry, is, uh, you know, um, the tele-ophthalmology. Um, it, it, the, it, it amazes me when you're involved in, in tele-education with someone and they are in the comfort of their own home. Like Priyanka said, you know, she's invited us into our kitchen. And those are, to me, are really big words, you know. Thank you, by the way, Priyanka. And, uh, but I, I do think that um, that's something that's new in medicine, a patient inviting you into their home to educate them. And if you can get your arms around it, because it's kind of clunky when you're sitting there doing surgery and you're seeing in-person patients and then boom you're doing a televisit and I'm not really great at it yet but I've committed myself to getting better because I do think it's the future and you know I've had patients that for post-op visits that I've had to change my mindset I mean I just had a hard time I would have never imagined that I'm not sitting there you know, looking directly at the slit lamp and checking their pressure right there and doing these things that just feel so awkward not doing. So we see them three, four hours after surgery and make sure they're doing well. And then we rely a lot on their symptoms and get as close as possible for an eye exam. And it's just, it's a mindset change that uh, has been awkward, but I do think we're gonna get better. And I do think it's here to stay. And I think the practices who can figure out how to continue to grow and keep it enthusiastic and caring, it doesn't have to be a negative patient experience. I think it can actually be something that shows a patient that you're willing to see them in person, you're willing to see them through tele-ophthalmology, you're willing to fuss over them and meet them where they want you to meet them. And so I, I think it's here to stay, Sherry. Any, any of you uh, have other things that you think uh, as far as what's here to stay because of I what you learned during COVID? I think one of the positive things that you know is happening globally, nationally, and even on a micro level in our practices is how you can digest education. And so I think more than ever before, as a fellow, as a resident, you get access to um, some of the top you know webinars uh, like the ASCRS 20 Happy Masters Series. 
Um, you know, whereas before you had to like take time off, use your stipend and then kind of go to the meeting and scramble around and maybe meet three people. But now you can actually see webinars. Um, you can get um, access to some of the top minds and perspectives all at almost too much. Like there's, there's too much education. And that's one thing that I think has changed. I think that's one thing that, you know, even in the practice, we do education uh, on webinars, uh, you know, at, at different hours. So um, I think that's a change and I think that's here to stay. I think Ralph's right. And even more so is the shift towards the Netflix, Amazon model It's on demand. We're doing this live right now, but we'll actually get far more viewers later in the week and next week on their own time. And so I think moving towards, you know, streaming it as you wish is probably the best. You know, I made, a, I made my own channel of uh, cataract videos, cataractcoach.com. I put a new video up every day for the last 930 days in a row. And we're getting two to 3,000 ophthalmologists on that website every day. And Those so are great people, videos, by the way. Those are great, Uday. Thank you. I need one of yours on there. But thank you. They're five minutes, and they're edited, and you can watch them on your phone. Ralph, back when we were residents, I used to hunt for VHS tapes, which people <laughs> don't know what that is anymore. My surgeries don't take five minutes. That'd have to be two surgeries. Okay, that's fine. Bring it to me. <laughs> <laughs> remember we used to hunt for vhs tapes to watch other people operate or you'd have to go visit them in their ors i still now, have them now you can watch it on hd on your phone anywhere on the planet i think that's a huge benefit huge benefit as a fellow and a resident just to have access to all that knowledge absolutely huge uh, priyanka you know i feel like when we talk tell ophthalmology you light up and what uh i would love your perspective of what it was like before COVID, during, and now, and how you see the future. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I, I love the idea of teleophthalmology and I love the idea of enhancing it because I do feel like I used it more months ago. And now that we're back to like full in person, finding the time for the teleophthalmology has become a little bit of a struggle again. Um, when we didn't have anything else to do, it was like, yeah, let me do these teleophthalmology visits. It's fun, it's exciting. And now it's like, oh my gosh, I actually have a full day of patients. Oh my gosh, I have a full day of OR. So I think that it's going to be, I mean, I think it would be amazing if ophthalmology could be as capable of telehealth as other subspecialties. So I have, friends in GI, in rheumatology, and they are still doing, you know, 50% telehealth because they can, because so much of their interactions are just history or sending out for labs and testing. So I'd love to see us get there because one of the really interesting things that I think um, some of the things from COVID that have been really great is the flexibility that it allows our residents even for lectures or for grand rounds. Like some of our residents will be like holding their child while they're watching grand rounds. And I think that's wonderful. Some of the lectures that I've given, like, you know, they get to still be with their family a little bit longer, but still be involved. And I think when we're talking about this age of, you know, diversion and equity and inclusion, isn't it so amazing that we might be able to offer some of these, this flexibility to our residents where it used to be so stringent, you have to be there at 7 a.m. And if you're five minutes late, you know, you're going to hear about it from the program director, but they have flexibility now, which is really wonderful. Um, so I think the technology is awesome. I'm looking forward it to, for it, forward to it advancing um, for us in ophthalmology, because I do think it would be great to work from home two days a week, the way some of my rheumatology and GI colleagues or, you know, dermatology colleagues are doing, um, but we haven't quite gotten there. I hope to get there soon. The, uh, there's a question here. Uh, um, um, from uh, Nandini, and and uh, Nandini is asking, you know, what advice are you all providing for your senior resident trainees or fellows as they begin the job search, especially when there are many hiring freezes occurring at this time? From my perspective, uh, I guess I, I. I'm wondering, uh, many parts of the country, I don't think there's a hiring freeze. I mean, we're, you know, slammed busy. <laughs> I mean, we're really uh, trying to figure out how to do what we do safely as these uh, 
at the volumes that we're uh, doing them and how much should be, you know, tele and how much should be in person. And so I think that, um, you know, I, I, um, I think when you start looking, there's a lot of opportunity out there. And, and I, I think that's going to continue. Um, you know, we have a profession that is uh, aging <laughs> and we have a uh, population that's aging. And so there's going to be more need for ophthalmologists than I think there is. And, and so, um, and like my, I remember I asked the same question to my grandpa uh, and my dad who were doctors way back when, and they said, there'll never be an excess of great doctors. And so, you know, just doing a great job in your training and being a good person, um, I think you're going to find that job will be there. Uh, other yeah. thoughts? Yeah, Nandini, great question. I had to say her name right. <laughs> um, just be scrappy. You know what? You can't predict what's going to happen. Just go with it. Think out, think differently. Do whatever it takes. You'll be fine. There are no shortage of patients. And it is a great time to be an ophthalmologist. I think, I think the most difficult thing is when, when I'm when I'm listening to, um, like the the applicants and 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 listening to them, they have a very limited view of sort of the business landscape. Um, it's almost like the business, the word business in training is still um, sort of uh, you know lower on the totem pole in terms of education. So they, they a lot of them think that you know I have to go out, I have to join a group, um, I can't start a private practice. I mean I've been in solo practice for 21 years. Um, we are hiring Nandini and just like Vance, I mean, things are very, very busy here and we're trying to, uh, you know, uh, the practice is growing. But, um, you know, I think being aware and educating yourself about the different business models and the opportunities will be very helpful. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of challenges in high care right now, too. There's private equity, there's um, large group practice, there's academic practice, there's hybrid practices. You have the panelists all represented here of that kind of practice style. Um, and there's a lot of um, uh, docs that I know that are starting out, you know, their own solo practices now. Some of them are leaving big groups and starting, some of them are starting from scratch. So there's just a lot of opportunity. And really, it goes back to mindfulness. You got to know your why. Um, that would be the advice. Know what, who you want to be. Um, which is easier asked than figured out. Um, some people say, find out where you want to live, but I would say, who do you want to be? And then um, start keeping an open mind, educate yourself about business um, models as much as you are educating yourself about surgery techniques. Um, and there are resources out there for that. What a wonderful conversation. And I have more questions, but I'm going to plant a seed on a question we're going to end with, but I'm not asking it. I just want you to be prepared. Uh, but one thing that you, you know, uh, you know, would do if you were a, you know, trainee right now. And, uh, you know, so we're going to, you're each going to give our advice, but, but not yet. And uh, so I think, uh, you know, we're talking a lot about how things went virtual. I'd love to hear how much you've missed in-person meetings, because I think for residents and fellows, do you remember the excitement of your first meeting? And oh, yeah. uh, I, I, what, what, how much do you guys miss that? We miss the human interaction, meeting all your friends. I mean, I can get the educational stuff online, on demand, but just seeing, go to an academy or ASRS meeting and seeing hundreds of people, your friends, in person, just shaking their hand, have a drink with them, have dinner with them, there's something that, gosh, I really yearn for that. I miss it. Yeah, I, I still have, um, when I was a resident, I attended my first ASTRS in San Diego and uh, Charlie Kelman was still around giving the uh, young ophthalmology section FACO lecture. And I have wow. I had a copy of his first book and he, I still have, he signed it for me. And uh, so the inventor of fake homosification as a resident. So, I mean, my, the first few meetings, you're just sort of starstruck. I mean, it took about five years to figure out your way around, my way around the circus. <laughs> but I'd walk down the halls and I'd be like, oh my God, there's Vance Thompson. And there's, you know, all these like people that I watch their videos and, you know, try to emulate throughout the years. And it's just like, uh, um, it's super cool. And that, you, there's no, that's the intangible that, you know, you can't get and uh, on a Zoom. 
but uh, but I, but you also can't, you know, like if you miss the meeting and you and you didn't get to see, you know, like somebody who you wanted to learn from um, nowadays, you can go back on a webinar and get it. So I think there's like this sort of, I don't know, there's something else that you can be positive and look for that, that opportunity. Yeah, I mean, so I'm a hugger and <laughs> really miss hugging people. I am too. <laughs> um, I, I look forward to that day when I can <laughs> hug all y'all someday. Um, but I think the other thing that we miss are kind of those like chance magical happenings that happen sometimes when you're at a meeting. You know, that person that you didn't know who you met. Um, and then reconnecting with the people that you've known from the past. Um, I think it goes back to that staying curious and, and being open. Um, you never know what you're gonna find at that next step unless, unless you have these chance happenings. And that's what's so beautiful about these meetings where suddenly you meet the friend of a friend or you, know, you end up on the bus or from your hotel to the conference center sitting next to someone else and you know, these things happen. So I think those, those are the things that I really miss. You know, I, I think that um, my advice to trainees on, on this one too is even though you've been uh, raised in a world that's quite virtual and you can do virtual very well uh, to, you know, listen to my uh, fellow docs here that it's kind of like, you know, when you get that invitation to a wedding on the other side of the country from someone you care about, you have a decision to make, but you never regret it when you show up. There's just something about being there. In the relationships in ophthalmology, there's obviously we've learned a lot about virtual, but nothing replaces in-person meetings. And I, I just don't see them going away, team. I do wonder, you know, how long everybody, you know, until they feel comfortable. Uh, but, you know, right now I'm in a busy clinic where the patients have to mask and, you know, I'm masking and, hey, I'll go to a meeting if, People are going to, you know, respect that. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm excited for meetings uh, soon. How about um, any questions that you guys, before we, you know, get to the final question, we've been talking for a while and uh, our time's going to be up pretty soon. Anything that I haven't asked that uh, you guys would like uh, to talk about a little bit more? Just remember, I think you'll learn more in your first couple of years of practice about ophthalmology and surgery than he did in the previous 10 years. Right. So it, don't think that just because your training is over, the learning, is, the learning stops and this is, you're done. In fact, you're just beginning. I think too, um, I guess this should be more obvious to me, but when Priyanka said, we're all in the same boat, to remember that trainees, uh, you're all in the same boat. And, 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 you know, you, all of our emails are public. You'll find that it's easy to get other ophthalmologists to spend time with you and, and teach you and have an opinion. Um, it's a very collegial profession. And I was attracted to it at a young age and it's been even uh, more enriching than I would have imagined. So. Uh, we're there for you um, to help fill in whatever, you know, gaps. And, and I think that uh, great physicians, I know me, I, I know what I'm an expert at and I know what I'm not an expert at. And when you become an expert at something and realize what you're not an expert at, you ask other ex experts. And I have partners who are brilliant, who I lean on. And I think it's just really important to remember that, especially if there's gaps uh, in your training that you don't feel comfortable with, uh, just it's a compliment to someone who is in practice um, or when you ask uh, their opinion, like I said, one of the most powerful things a human can do is make them feel like they matter. And, and a patient coming and trusting, uh, a trainee coming and trusting, these are big deals and, and, and it's at your fingertips, so. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, we don't even realize sometimes how lucky, lucky we are in ophthalmology because this is all we know. 
but I love it when I hear from our industry partners who leave ophthalmology and then they want to like rush back to ophthalmology because <laughs> we're so collegial with one another and we support one another and they don't see that in other fields of medicine. So to the trainees who are out there who are like excited about ophthalmology, stay excited because you've got wonderful colleagues who are supportive and who are innovative and uh, you know, we, we will get through this. So it may be hard right now and together we'll get through it. Yeah. And lean on your industry partners. Uh, I'm glad you said industry, Priyanka. It amazes me how supportive they've all been through this. And there's a lot of training and education that is there through them. And uh, uh, that's been so helpful. Well, maybe um, since I've given you a little time to think about uh, our question in closing, one thing that, that you know, you, what, what would you uh, do if you were a trainee right now um, uh, to deal with this time to uh, a piece of advice that you would give? My, mine stayed pretty consistent throughout. And I would just really like highlight staying curious and utilizing your connections that you have and staying curious about which connections they can help provide for you. I mean, we're all going to help one another through this, but just stay curious, stay flexible, and, and you'll make it through. My advice is you have in your training a very finite period of time where you are operating side by side, scrubbed in together with a more senior doctor, with an attending, and to maximize each and every one of those experiences because it's really short-lived and that safety net will soon disappear when you're done with your residency or fellowship. And that means before every case, prepping the night before. If you're doing a new procedure, a new surgery you haven't done, going and watching a bunch of YouTube videos. Really come to the OR absolutely prepared so you can maximize your learning during this specific time. And then finally, I know residency is hard, but it's the same way that when I was 16, I thought 11th grade was hard. But you know, you look back now, you think, God, 11th grade was the walk in the park. And you'll look back on your residence and your fellowship as some of the best times of your life and some of the easiest. Yeah, I like that. I, I really like that, Uday. I think, um, you know, showing up every day um, and maximizing this training time is a uh, it's like when you, if you look back on your college days, you had, you know, versus medical school, then versus residency and training. Um, but, you know, what I got out of this is what I would say is um, be resilient, be flexible, um, you know, look for um, sort of the, the blue ocean, you know, like maybe, maybe where everybody's not going is where the opportunities are. And so sometimes, um, you know, I remember going uh, to a cocktail party and I talked to a graduate of a very well-known academic institution. He's like, you know, well, private practice is dead. No one can go into private practice. Then he asked me, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm in private practice. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, um, it was a very interesting perspective um, about how narrow-minded uh, it's easy to get that way. So yeah. um, reach out. I mean, if you're attending and listening to this webinar, um, you've already done, um, probably you're on the right track. Um, and so I think uh, I echo what everybody else has said, but look forward there's a ton of opportunity still ahead of us, um, you know, and that's, that's what I would say. And I, I uh, you know, this, this idea of surrounding yourself with the right people, uh, you three are a perfect example of why, you know, I was looking so forward to this. You know, I think, I think BMC has a culture uh, of education that um, a lot of us are attracted to in the world of ophthalmology. Um, but how they can put together four people that um, can just have such a, a, a joyful time together. Uh, I would take note of that. And as you look for a practice to find people that are just joyful and positive uh, to be around. As far as advice, um, you know, I think that that when things slow down uh, clinically or surgically for a while, um, there's just, like everyone said, amazing sources of education and rolling up your sleeves and, you know, preparing for boards even more and, and, and watching uh, some of those uh, programs out there that are real good and spending more time with your attendees, attendings. And uh, this is an intellectual game too, the practice of ophthalmology. And 
and and sometimes the surgery which we all love uh, can get maybe glorified a little too much sometimes and to you know remember that if you you know know what to do the carrying it out um, is uh, a lot easier to do and you can even get eye bank eyes and you can practice and it's a mindset when you're practicing and you say this is my family members you know i i'm practicing on even though it's you know a cadaver or an animal eye you can take your mindset to another level to work on the mechanics of surgery um and so if there's there's a will there's a way um and you've noticed that those things that you probably worried about in March, April, and May, you're probably wondering why I was so worried because you're so darn busy again and, uh, and everything's gonna be okay. But I just wanna say thank you to BMC for sponsoring this and putting me together with you, Ralph, and you, Priyanka, and you, Uday, uh, just three beautiful uh, souls to do this with. And I wish you all a, a good evening. Back to Practice has been made possible with support from Allergan, an AbV company, Johnson & Johnson Vision, and IOR Partners for Office-Based Surgery. We'd like to thank our sponsors for their support of this programming. This webcast podcast is intended solely for ophthalmic healthcare professionals and ophthalmic industry representatives. By accessing this webcast podcast, I acknowledge that Bryn Mawr Communications LLC, here in BMC, along with any all third-party corporate supporters of this webcast podcast, makes no warranty, guarantee, or representation as to the accuracy or sufficiency of the information presented in this webcast podcast. BMC, along with any all third-party corporate supporters of this webcast podcast, do not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any of the opinions or information presented or mentioned. BMC expressly disclaims any and all liability or responsibility for any direct, indirect, incidental, special, consequential, or other damages arising out of any individual's use of, reference to, reliance on, in this webcast podcast.